denominator is equal to zero. So where is this denominator equal to zero? So again, if I take x plus one and set it equal to zero, what value for x will give you zero in the denominator? Negative, negative one. So I know the domain's gonna be all real numbers such that x cannot be equal to negative one. All right, take a look at b. Again, the domain's gonna be all real numbers except where x is not gonna be equal to. So when I set this denominator equal to zero, x squared minus nine equals zero. What values for x would give you zero in this denominator? It would be what? Negative three and positive three. So the domain's gonna be all real numbers except negative three and three. So you take a look at c. We have x squared minus one over x plus five. Excuse me, again, I know the domain's gonna be all real numbers except where my denominator is equal to zero. So in this particular case, I have two factors. So I have to set x squared minus one equal to zero, x plus five equals zero. So where, what are the x values that would give me zero in the denominator of this fraction? This is gonna be what? Negative five and what else? One and negative one. So you have three values you have to exclude from the domain. So the domain is going to be all real numbers except negative five, one, and negative one. Any questions on how you guys can find the domain of these rational expressions? Um, taking a look at D. Again, I know the domain is going to be all reals. Again, what happens when I try and set this denominator equal to zero? Well, I know I would subtract four, and then how would you solve for x? What would you do to both sides? You would take the what? square root. So what kind of solutions when I solve this is going to be the square root of negative 4? These are going to be what? Imaginary. So there is no value for x that I could plug in where we'd get 0 in the denominator. So this is a case where the domain is going to be all real numbers. So it is possible that you do have a domain of all real numbers for these rational expressions. Yes, Emma? So it can't be 2 because there's a negative in the radical? Exactly. Okay. Yep, it'd be imaginary. It'd be plus or minus 2i. Remember those lovely imaginary numbers you did last year? All right. So suppose that I've got these two expressions here. Um, when you are uh, looking at these rational expressions, remember as long as there's, if they have no common factors in the numerator and denominator, then we say that the fraction is in simplified form. So remember from last year, you would factor the numerator factor the denominator, and you would check for those common factors. We always want to try and simplify these rational expressions whenever possible. Um, if x approaches some number c, and if as you're approaching some value, the graph turns up or down, remember last year you guys talked about vertical asymptotes. So this is that new piece we're going to talk about. Um, these vertical asymptotes actually, again, when you start talk, we start introducing limits, which we're going to do in the next unit, they relate to asymptotes quite a bit. A vertical asymptote in calculus is written this a certain way. We're used to seeing the limit as x approaches positive or negative infinity. C is actually now a number. And when you see this C to the plus, this means you're looking on the right-hand side of that number to the right of C, whatever that number is. When you see this negative exponent, this C with the negative exponent, this means you're looking to the left of C. So if you are approaching a vertical asymptote, let's suppose C is a vertical asymptote. One of two things could happen with the limit. It's either going to go towards positive infinity or negative infinity on either side. So if you are approaching a vertical asymptote, what's creating the asymptote is the behavior of the graph is going to be pointing up towards infinity or down towards negative infinity. If you remember when you graphed asymptotes last year. So let's take a look at an example here. So my vertical asymptotes are at 2 and negative 3. Does everybody see that the vertical asymptotes are at 2 and negative 3? So with the limit notation, we would see the limit as x approaches 2 from the right. So if I ask you, 
to find the limit as x approaches 2 from the right. What you do is you just take your pencil, go to your asymptote at x equals 2, and go to the right of 2. Now, look at what's happening with the graph. Now, to the right of 2, what's happening with this graph as you're getting closer and closer to 2? What direction is it approaching? It's approaching what? Infinity. So the limit as x approaches 2 from the right is going towards infinity. So then we have the limit as x approaches 2 from the left. Again, that negative sign is the exponent tells you whether you're on the right or on the left. If it's a negative, you're on the left. If it's a positive, you're on the right. So now take your pencil, just like we did with the going to the right, and if I want to find the limit as x approaches 2 from the left, take your pencil and go to the left of 2. And now trace your graph. As you're approaching 2 from the left, what direction is that graph going? It's going towards what? Negative infinity. So we say it's going towards negative infinity. So if I ask you to find the limit as x approaches an asymptote, this is what you're looking at. You're looking again at the behavior. You're looking at whether it's going towards positive or negative infinity. Now let's look at the other vertical asymptote, the limit as x approaches negative 3 from the left. So again, my vertical asymptote is at negative 3. Again, I want to go to the left of negative 3. Take your pencil and go to the left of negative 3. Trace your graph. As you're getting closer and closer to negative 3 on the left-hand side, what direction are you going? You're going towards what? What direction are we getting close to? Positive infinity. And then the limit as x approaches negative 3 from the right. Again, take your pencil, go to the right of negative 3. Now trace your graph. As you're getting closer and closer to negative 3 from the right, what direction are you approaching? You're approaching what? We're, getting, we're go, doing what? We're going down, so we're going towards what? Negative infinity. Okay? So any questions on that limit notation there? All right? So now let's look at the next one. You have a vertical asymptote at negative 2. You have a vertical asymptote at negative 1. And a vertical asymptote at 2. So let's look at the limit as x approaches negative 2 from the left. So again, go to negative 2 on your x-axis. Move your pencil to the left of negative 2. As your graph is getting closer and closer to negative 2 on the left, what's happening with the behavior? It's going towards what? Infinity. So now look at the limit as x approaches negative 2 from the right. Again, take your pencil, pencil, go to the right of negative 2. Trace your graph. As you're getting closer and closer to negative 2 from the right, what direction are we going? We're going towards what? Negative infinity. Okay. So now look at the limit as x approaches negative 1. Look at your other vertical asymptote. Again, negative 1 is your vertical asymptote. That plus means we're going to look at the right. So go to the right-hand side of negative 1. Take your pencil. Trace the graph. As you're getting closer and closer to negative 1, what direction are we approaching? We're approaching what? We're going towards what? We're going towards infinity. The limit is x approaches negative 1 from the left. You tell me what's happening to the left of negative 1. What direction is this graph going? It's going what? Up or down? Down. So if it's going down, we say it's going towards what? Negative infinity. Okay? So that's what's happening with limits as you're approaching an asymptote. All right? So now you guys tell me. Find the limit as x approaches 2 from the right. The limit as x approaches 2 from the left. So you guys go ahead and do those two limits for me. So you should come up with, on the right-hand side, you should be going towards negative infinity. 
and then on the left hand side you're going towards positive infinity. So any questions on how you find the limits around an asymptote? All right. Discontinuity you guys also talked a little bit about last year. We may talk a little bit more than what you did last year. If you have a value that's in the denominator that gives you zero, um, f of x is um, discontinuous. So if you have some value in the denominator of the function, then we say that the function is discontinuous. And that particular value, as we just talked about, is not in the domain. So whatever values, when you set the denominator equal to zero, we know those values are not in the domain. We call this function discontinuous. So we say it's not continuous at x equals a, and the function has removable or non-removable discontinuity at x equals a. So there's two types of discontinuity, removable and non-removable. So take a look at this fraction. What do you notice about what's in common in the numerator and denominator? It has a common what? Factor. So we know we could simplify this fraction, couldn't we? So, But notice, we still have a value of zero that occurs in the denominator. So negative two cannot be in the domain. So we call this one removable discontinuity. There is a hole. When this happens, you have what's called a hole in the graph. And again, like I said, this is called a removable discontinuity. So a hole is removable discontinuity because you can make the graph continuous by filling in that point. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Now look at the difference of this function, x plus 4 over x minus 2. Is there a common factor you can cancel out? We call this one non-removable discontinuity at x equals 2. Again, I know it's not defined at 2, so there's no way to redefine this. What's happening here is you have a vertical asymptote at 2. So when you have a common factor like we did in this example, we call this removable discontinuity. There's a hole in the graph. There's a difference. So when we're getting ready to graph these, you've got to identify, is it a hole versus an asymptote? An asymptote is when you have no common factor, and we call that one non-removable. Again, like I said, if the rational function has non-removable, then we have a vertical asymptote. The function in simplest form has no common factors. To find the vertical asymptote, you set the denominator equal to zero. If the rational function has removable discontinuity, the graph will have a hole at a point. A hole is a point. Okay. So now let's just take a look at some a practice what we've just been talking about. So first of all, let's talk about the domain. How do you find the domain? It's going to be all real numbers except where you get what in the denominator, when you get what in the denominator to find the domain. What do you do with the denominator? You're going to set it what? Mm -hmm. Equal to zero. So x squared minus 4x plus 3 equals zero. So to solve this, what are we going to do? We're going to factor it. So factors of 3 add together give me negative 4 is going to be an x minus 3, x minus 1. So another way to write this whole fraction is x plus 3 over x minus 3 times x minus 1. So what's my domain going to be then? All real numbers except what? Um, positive, three. positive 3 and four, positive, one. positive 1. So my domain's all real numbers except 3 and 1. Points of discontinuity. So where is this graph going to be discontinuous? Well, whatever values you exclude from the domain, that's where it's going to be discontinuous. It's discontinuous at x equals 3 and x equals 1. That's where you're going to have a hole or an asymptote. Those are the x values you have a break. Now let's talk about what kind of discontinuity you're going to have. x equals 3. At x equals 3, is it going to be a vertical asymptote or is it going to be a hole? Do you see a common factor of x minus 3 in the numerator and in the denominator? No. 
So we know we're going to have a vertical asymptote at x equals 3. And what kind of discontinuity do we call a vertical asymptote? We call that non-removable. If it's a vertical asymptote, we call that non-removable discontinuity at x equals 1. Do you have a common factor of x minus 1 in the numerator and in the denominator? Do you see a common factor of x minus 1 on the top? No. So that's going to be another vertical asymptote. So we call that non-removable. So both at x equals 3 and x equals 1, we call that non-removable discontinuity. Do you have any holes? No. The only time you're going to have a hole is if you have that common factor that you can cancel out on the top and the bottom. So there are no holes. The vertical asymptotes then are at x equals 3 and x equals 1. Again, the only time you're going to have a hole is if you can simplify that fraction if you have that common factor in the numerator and the denominator. If you can't cancel them out, then you know you have vertical asymptotes. And at vertical asymptotes, we call that non-removable discontinuity. Okay. Let's take a look at number two. First of all, the domain is going to be all real numbers. Now, I have to set the denominator equal to zero and solve. So x squared is equal to negative one. What happens if I try and solve that for x on the bottom? I end up with what kind of values? Imaginary. So that my domain is going to be all real numbers. So there is no place where this function will be undefined. So there are no points of discontinuity. If there's no values you're excluding from the domain, then I know this graph is continuous for all real numbers. So therefore, there is no removable or non-removable discontinuity I have to worry about. There are no holes. There are no vertical asymptotes. Holes and all vertical asymptotes are only going to happen when you get zero in the denominator fraction for x. All right? Let's take a look at another one. So let's take a look at x squared minus 3x minus 4. First of all, what's the domain going to be? It's going to be all real numbers, except where is it going to give me 0 in the bottom? It's going to be what? 4. So it's going to be all real numbers, except where x can't be equal to 4. So since 4 is not in the domain, where is uh, the discontinuity going to occur? It's going to occur where? At x equals what? Four. Now the question is, what kind of discontinuity do we have? Well, what can you do with that numerator? You can do what with the numerator? Because you have to see if you have a common factor on the top and the bottom. What can you do with the top? Can you factor? So now you have to decide if you've got a vertical asymptote at x equals 4 or if you have a hole. Can you factor the numerator? Can you factor the numerator? Can you factor the numerator? Yes. yes. What does it factor into? X minus 4 and X plus 1. So tell me what's happening at X equals 4. You have that common factor. Notice you can simplify this fraction. So at X equals 4, is that going to be a whole or is that going to be an asymptote? It's a hole, so we call that removable. Graphically, ladies and gentlemen, what happens is when you cancel and simplify your fraction, graphically, your original problem and what you have left are exactly the same graph, except you're going to have that hole at just that one point, all right? Um, so now we do have a hole. To find the hole, remember it is a point. A point has an x value and it has a y value. Well, we know what the x value is, which is 4. To find the y value, you need to take 4, plug it back into the simplified form of that fraction. So y is going to be equal to 4 plus 1. So what's the y coordinate of this hole going to be? It's going to be at 5. We'll get into graphing these next class. Right now we're just going to be practicing finding all the different pieces. 
there are no vertical asymptotes. Okay. So any questions on how you find the whole? The whole is an or, or the whole is an ordered pair. You have to find the x and the y. Let's take a look at number four. The domain. I know it's going to be all real numbers except x can't be equal to what? Set the denominator equal to zero. So what values are we going to exclude from the domain? The domain is going to be what? All real numbers except what? Four and negative four. So where is this graph going to be discontinuous? It's going to be discontinuous at what? Four and where? Negative four. Now what's happening at four and negative four? Are they asymptotes or are they holes? Asymptotes. So what do we call asymptotes? Removable or non-removable? Non-removable. And when they are asymptotes, the non-removable is also called infinite discontinuity. I should add that in there. Non-removable and infinite, infinite is a type of discontinuity and that occurs at asymptotes. Do you have any holes here? No. Vertical asymptotes, remember, you write as equations of lines, x equals 4 and x equals negative 4. So any questions, guys, on the difference between a hole versus a vertical asymptote? Um, we talked about this in the last unit. If x approaches positive or negative infinity and it approaches a fixed number, then we have what's called a horizontal asymptote. And if you remember from the last unit, we talk about the horizontal asymptote as the end behavior. As x approaches positive infinity or x approaches negative infinity, remember, this is end behavior. Just like what you took your quiz on. One of three things could happen. It could be positive infinity, negative infinity, or the value of the horizontal asymptote. So when you're looking as x approaches positive or negative infinity, it can only be one of three things. Positive, negative infinity, or horizontal asymptote. So let's take a look at example 3a. So remember, in the limit notation, the limit as x approaches infinity of f of x, or the limit as x approaches negative infinity of f of x. Notice, unlike your polynomials that we took a look at, the end behavior is not going towards positive or negative infinity. Remember, when I ask you about the limit as x approaches positive infinity, what side of the graph are we looking at, the right or the left? What side are we looking at as you approach positive infinity, the what? The right. So on the right-hand side of this graph, as you're going to, towards infinity, what value are you getting really close to? The graph is not pointing up or down. What y value is this graph getting really close to? Two. So we would then say the limit as x approaches infinity is 2. The limit as x approaches negative infinity. What side of the graph are we looking at, the right or the left? Left. So then on the left-hand side, notice the graph is not pointing up or down. It's approaching a y value, which is equal to what? 2. So when you have graphs with horizontal asymptotes, this is what's happening with the end behavior. All right, let's look at B. It's possible to have more than one horizontal asymptote. So the limit as x approaches positive infinity. We're looking on the right-hand side. What y value are we getting really, really close to? We're getting really close to what? Negative 4. On the left-hand side, What y value are we getting really, really close to? We're getting really, really close to what? Getting really, really close to what? Negative 3. So you look on the left and look on the right. It's possible that you could have different things happening. Okay? So any questions on the horizontal asymptotes? 
Last year, you talked about, again, there's lots of different ways your Algebra 2 teachers could have talked to you about finding horizontal asymptotes. It's a review of the rules. Remember, you look at the degree of the numerator and you compare it with the degree of the denominator. Remember, if the degree of the numerator is less than the degree of the denominator, do you guys remember where the horizontal asymptote is? If the top is less than the bottom, do you remember where it is? Zero. Y equals zero. So, for example, by the way, what's the degree of one? Zero. Remember, the degree of any constant is zero. What's the degree of x plus 2, the denominator? The degree of x plus 2, what's the degree of x plus 2? 1. So that I know 0 is less than 1, so the horizontal asymptote is at y equals 0. If the degree of the numerator is larger than the bottom, there is no horizontal asymptote, remember. There may be a slant. You may not have gotten into doing slants last year, or obliques. Slant and obliques are the same. So, for example, what's the degree of the numerator? The degree of the numerator is what? Two. Two. What's the degree of the bottom? One. So, when the top is greater than the bottom, there is no horizontal asymptote. When they're the same, the horizontal asymptote is a ratio of the leading coefficients. means you have to make a fraction. Again, look at the degree of the top. What's the degree of the numerator? Two. What's the degree of the denominator? Two. So when they're the same degree, you make a ratio of the leading coefficient. What's the leading coefficient of the numerator? The leading coefficient of the numerator is a what? Four. The leading coefficient of the denominator is a two. So the horizontal asymptote would be at y equals 2. So those are the three conditions that can happen. So any questions on how you find a horizontal asymptote? If you have your fraction where it's improper, what makes an improper fraction is when the numerator's power is greater than the denominator's then we have what's called an oblique or slant asymptote. And you have to do your favorite long division to find it. If the degree of the numerator is, the, is uh, one more than the denominator, you use long division to find your oblique asymptote. It depends on what the denominator looks like. Most of the time, you're going to end up with long division. Okay. So let's take a look at this example. First of all, is synthetic even an option for this? No. You agree with me that the degree of the numerator is 4, correct? What's the degree of the denominator? 3. So when the top is larger than the bottom, there is no horizontal asymptote. You have a slant. And the way you find it is you have to do long division. So I have to take x to the third plus x squared minus 4, divide it into 5x to the fourth. Again, I'm going to put those placeholder as 0x to the third minus x squared plus 0x plus 0. You want to keep all those like terms lined up, remember. So now remember the way you start long division. Take x to the third, divide it into 5x to the fourth. What is 5x to the 4th divided by x to the 3rd? 5x to the 4th divided by x to the 3rd is what? What's that going to give you? 5x to the 4th divided by x to the 3rd is what? 5x. Place that above my x. After I divide, remember, I'm going to multiply. 5x times x to the 3rd is a 5x to the 4th. 5x times x squared, 5x to the 3rd. 5x times negative 4 is a negative 20x. Remember, line that up underneath your 0x. After I multiply, what do I do? I'm going to subtract. 
0x to the third minus 5x to the third is a negative 5x to the third. Bring down your negative x squared. 0x minus negative 20x is going to give me plus 20x. You repeat again. x to the third goes into negative 5x to the third. Yeah, you can bring down the 0, yeah. So x to the third minus 5x, when I divide negative 5x to the third, divided by x to the third, what's that going to leave me with? Negative 5. Multiply again, negative 5 times x to the third is a negative 5x to the third. Negative 5 times x squared is a negative 5x squared. Negative 5 times negative 4 is a plus 20. Subtract, that cancels, negative x squared minus negative 5x squared is going to give me a 4x squared, plus 20x minus 20. So what is all this at the bottom here? That is all your what? Remainder. Now, since you're only finding the oblique asymptote, you can disregard the remainder. Your answer is just going to be this particular line, y equals 5x minus 5. So instead of having vertical lines as asymptotes, instead of having horizontal lines as asymptotes, you now have lines that are in the form of y equals mx plus b. You can disregard this remainder. When we get to limits in the next unit, you'll see why we're going to be able to disregard this particular limit. Okay? So any questions on how you find an oblique if you have it? Let's go down to this bottom page of 14. Let's take a look at B. Tell me what your vertical asymptote is for B. Vertical asymptote comes from what? Setting what equal to zero? Denominator. So what's this vertical asymptote going to be? X equals what? Negative one-fourth. Remember when I ask you for asymptotes, you give me equations of lines. Do you have a horizontal asymptote or oblique? You'll never have both. It's one or the other. Tell me about the degree of the numerator when you compare it with the degree of the denominator. They are what? Mm -hmm. Equal. So what's the horizontal asymptote going to be? Y equals what? Three over four. Remember when the degrees are the same, you make a ratio of the leading coefficients. You can't have an oblique and a horizontal in the same problem. So what's the domain going to be? It's going to be all real numbers except what? X can't be equal to what? Negative one-fourth. Remember, the domain goes with the vertical asymptotes, wherever the denominator is equal to zero. All right? Any questions on that? Let's take a look at C. Do you have a vertical asymptote? Where's your vertical asymptote? X equals what? Negative 5. Do you have a horizontal asymptote? Yes or no? No, because the degree of the numerator is 2, the degree of the denominator is 1. So 2 is greater than 1, so there is no horizontal asymptote. How do you find the oblique? Now, this is a case, can you use synthetic division instead of long division? Yes. So to find your oblique, I can actually use synthetic division. Again, x plus 5 is the factor. You need the 0 in front of synthetic. Start with your 1. You've got to put a placeholder for x and 1. Bring down your very first coefficient of 1. Negative 5 times 1 is negative 5. 0 plus negative 5 is negative 5. Negative 5 times negative 5 is 25. 26 is my remainder. You can disregard the remainder. So again, the oblique asymptote is going to be just x minus 5. Again, write it as the equation of a line. So if you can, you can certainly use your, uh, instead of using long division, you can use your synthetic. What's the domain going to be? All real numbers except what? Negative 5. Okay. Let's take a look at E. 
To find the vertical asymptotes, what do you have to do at the bottom? You're going to have to do what? You're going to have to factor it. So this factors into x plus 5 times x minus 3. What are your vertical asymptotes? x equals negative 5. Do I have a vertical asymptote at 3? No. What's happening at x equals 3? You have a hole. Remember, a hole is not going to be an asymptote. But you do have to exclude the value from the domain. The domain is going to be all real numbers except x can't be equal to negative 5 and 3. You do have to exclude the value, remember, of the whole from the domain. So any questions on why you do not have an asymptote at 3, a vertical asymptote? Again, you can simplify this and look at 1 over x plus 5. Do you have a horizontal or an oblique asymptote? Which one do you have? Horizontal. And where is it going to be at it? Y equals what? Zero. All right. Any questions on that? So tonight for homework, guys, you're just going to practice finding all these different things.